after last night, but uh, it's great to be back in Glasgow and getting some wine in my hand. So, uh, believe it or not, I'm a Dundee grad, so I haven't been here in Scotland for an awful long time, and I'm living out in Ireland. Now, I'm just a simple father of five, rural, critical care physician, and uh, I changed something in my practice about uh, 12 months ago, it's only because of, I, I simply upgraded my old workhorse as a ventilator, and I, I got this new lighter ventilator. It just so happened to have a mode on it which really, I think we all need to kind of put our ears up a little bit because if like many of you, I've been disillusioned in quite like a risk now for many years. Because all I've been trying to do is uh, emulate the fine work of Paul and his, and his team and ended up getting those marginal gains. But something a little bit different happened. I have 39% loss arrived at the hospital right now in rural Ireland. And that's with all cause of risk. And I do not exclude any of those calls when I arrive at the South and Rosemary. In all the fusion oxygenation, I think we all agree is what we are to try to do, isn't it? By an optimum high performance CPR, as all of you can do. And I'm not going to teach you to suck eggs, but it's quite important just to have a quick recap on the physiology during normal compressions to see how this is different. So, downstroke, squeeze heart, rhythmic, you can go to sleep. <laughs> downstroke, squeeze heart, blood goes out, yeah, infuses the brain. Yeah, this is not as correct as some of you are with me. But what also happens during the downstroke is gas escapes. That's easy enough? Okay. Upstroke. The opposite, isn't it? So, we try to create a negative pressure into that chest, the negative depressive pressure. And the big thing that we've been battling with today is what? Trying to improve that negative pressure and pulling blood back into the heart. Improving venous drainage, cerebrally, improving ICP. Yes? If not, ice. I'm the one who's captain, and by the way, can you just put more around? Okay. What do we do to absolutely trance and absolutely destroy a normal diffusion? What do we do? Will that cause us to use CPR? Yeah. Anything we do, the you know, pulse checks, CPR chains, patient movements, rhythm checks, ventilatory causes, different relation. Every time we pause, we all of us, I'm told in the immediate, it requires 10 to 18 good compressions to start to get that perfusion back up again. So, what are we struggling with? We're struggling with a few things. So the first thing is the ventilation side. And if you know that hands only CPR is not inferior to all of you guys, using this diffusion reduction device. Yes? Because every time we take a big breath and put a big tidal volume into the thoracic to we increase the thoracic pressure. If we do it asynchronous to our chest compressions, we inflict high volumes, high pressures, which are damaging to the lung, which are absolutely detrimental to struggling through the diffusion. Yeah? So it's that balance of confusion and ventilation that we've been grappling with since time in the world. We've got another problem. It's a CRM challenge, isn't it? So we try to do CPR and ventilation, which is highly energetic. Whoa. Highly energetic, um, difficult physically tasks. At the same time, we need to try to mentally perform as well. So from a CRM perspective, we set ourselves up to completely fail. Yep. Yeah? Right. Let's try to make it easier. So chest compression, synchronized ventilation. It's simply an IPP mode of the ventilator, and I'll explain it to you. So during that time stroke of CPR, the gas is going to escape. Yes? So at the first point when you start to press, it triggers the ventilator. That is the ventilatory trigger. It then delivers a pressure, IPPV, nothing new, but the key being it delivers it 
during the rest of that down stroke. So you've got pressure in, increasing into thoracic pressure at the point where you really want to increase into thoracic pressure. That's the point. But it's the recoil that's far more interesting. Because during recoil, the gas has to escape. So it's the ultimate impedance threshold device. In fact, it's far more than that. You're actually dragging gas out at the point where you want to really create the maximum negative pressure in the thorax and create the maximum opportunity for both cerebral and coronary diffusion. Everything sucks back and then we go. So, that's grand, bit of science, so what? And these are real world examples. So what you will notice here, especially in cardiac arrest, they have oxygen sat to 96%, as measured for a fluid on the middle finger. You'll see the entire CO2 there. That's real. Slightly lower than what you expect to get, get a great big massive bag or two liter bag. Why? Because the tidal volume is only two mil per kilo. But it's a maximum frequency. Your respiratory rate there is a whopping 100 and whatever the CPR rate is. So it's truly sick. The trigger is directly linked to your CPR. So in this example, again, real life example, pediatric case, look at the blood pressure. 123, 80, 98. Look at the blood pressure. 155, whoa. 15, 155, 93. Guys, I'm not using adrenaline in any of those three cases. When do I use adrenaline? When they're septic, when they've got the SBR failure. Not the case. What this basically is allowing us to do is do exactly what the guidelines want us to do. In other words, improve oxygenation and improve fusion prior to defibrillation. So good, I've got a good blood pressure there, sats on great, defibrillate, haven't got any pauses there at all. And what I want to just come back now. Yeah, sats are only five percent. With the CO2, I want to CO2 absolutely jump as I figured it can't be got lost when you see it over the top. As I said, I'm just a rural father of five from the rural island. And I've got a feeling I'm like a percent CRM by far plays the greatest opportunity here. Because for the first time we're able to fully automate ventilation and fully automate CPR with the CPR device. And you combine those two. I get to do Sudoku alone in the back of the lab as we transport an hour or 20 minutes to the cath lab or with that patient profoundly hypothermic, just keep them going, don't bother, have a cup of tea, wait for them to warm up. Come and see us. I think you're in Karen 2, is that right? And uh, yeah, meet the team and meet Maggie. Thank you.